Hello, welcome to Peopling the Past. My name is Dr. Victoria Austin, and I'm currently a lecturer in the Classics Department at the University of Winnipeg. What topic are you talking about today? Today, I'm going to talk to you about ancient Roman gardens, or more specifically, I'm going to introduce to you some of the main categories of gardens from the late Republic and also the early empire. But before we dig in to the Roman evidence, we should first consider the basic question of what actually is a garden? Gardens and the act of gardening are a feature of practically every human community. And as such, we tend to recognize them fairly easily. But it is clear from just these images here that you can see that gardens across history come in many different shapes and sizes. And this in turn actually makes it quite difficult for us to define the spaces and provide a list of necessary conditions that a garden must meet in order to actually be called a garden. It is significant then that despite the many possible manifestations of what can constitute a garden, scholars continually assign two core principles to the space, albeit to various degrees. First is the notion of a garden boundary. Think a white picket fence, as you can see in the top image here. And the second is the notion of cultivation. So just as Victoria Pagan states here, the garden can generally, regardless of the form, be defined as a space set aside from its surroundings and one that is developed into something different from those surroundings through a process of cultivation. And this deliberate cultivation is then representative of a gardener's aim of controlling nature just enough to satisfy their needs. And that might be a physical need for food, like in a vegetable garden, or it may be an aesthetic need for pleasure, a nice, beautiful flower bed. So for the ancient Romans, the garden was just as it is today, a recognizable and defined space within their culture, often marked off by a boundary, and it provided a setting for or a backdrop to a whole range of activities and practices. In fact, the Latin word for garden, hortus, emphasizes that idea of enclosure or boundedness. It is derived from the Greek cortus, which means an enclosed space, um, an enclosed space used for growing food. And it's also noteworthy that Romans deemed their garden boundaries worthy enough of a protection of a god, Priapus, depicted here, who as a rustic scarecrow-like figure defended the garden from potential thieves or transgressors. And the god's presence in the garden can be seen as both a productive and also a prohibitive symbol. His often exposed phallus acts as a fairly crude warning against potential perpetrators, whilst acting still as a sign of his fertility. So these two roles really align nicely with the two core principles of garden space, boundedness and cultivation. What sources or data do you look at? Well, when it comes to studying Roman gardens, I am in many ways quite spoilt for choice in terms of source material. There is a significant amount of evidence for gardens in the late Republic and early empire, and also a huge amount of diversity within that corpus, both in terms of the different types of gardens that we know of, and also the range of media that this evidence appears in. So this volume and diversity really seems to suggest that garden culture held a particularly special place in the Roman imagination. Now, archeological investigation of the natural world is usually particularly complicated due to nature's intrinsic ephemeral status. But along the Bay of Naples in Italy, 
we have what's a really unique opportunity to analyze the green spaces of the ancient Roman world. When the Vesuvian volcanic eruption occurred in 79 CE, the entire city of Pompeii and also much of the surrounding region was essentially completely frozen in time, buried under a thick layer of ash that sealed the underground area in a unique state of preservation. Wilhelmina Jashemsky's pioneering research along the Bay of Naples and in Pompeii specifically provided a really important stimulus for the study of ancient Roman gardens. Beginning in the 1960s, Jashemsky combed through every inch of garden space in the city of Pompeii carefully documenting the surviving evidence in all its possible manifestations, including garden plants, obviously, but also architectural structures, ornamental features, and also depictions of gardens and plants in surviving wall paintings. Her creation of a systematic methodology for the excavation of the Vesuvian gardens has really allowed scholars to address previously underappreciated aspects of the daily life of Pompeii, namely those activities and economies associated with the garden. If you already have an image of a Roman garden in your mind, it is likely that it comes from these domestic settings in Pompeii. And it is even more likely that you have one particular type of garden in mind, which we can see here, and that is the peristyle garden. Here's the example from the house of Menander. And these peristyle gardens are primarily ornamental, ideally surrounded by four covered walkways supported by a series of columns, just as you can see here. Originally, these peristyle gardens appear to have been located at the rear of the house, but later examples from Pompeii, like the House of Menander, show an evolution towards a more central location in the domestic setting. And in this central location, these garden spaces become spaces of mediation and transition, a kind of very elegant route of access to different areas of the home. It's important to note though that the peristyle garden is only one of many different types of garden space in the Roman world, each with their own name and each with their own emphasis. And that emphasis may be practical, it may be aesthetic or perhaps even religious. And I have just showcased here just a few of the various terms and subcategories of garden spaces in the Roman world. Alongside these very real and physical garden spaces, the material evidence at Pompeii also demonstrates how much the Romans enjoyed depictions of garden spaces. And here we have a really stunning example of one of these garden themed frescoes from the house of the golden bracelet. And this particular fresco was actually located in a corridor like space adjacent to the real peristyle garden. So you have a really nice play here going on between the real garden space and also the depiction of garden space in close proximity. And even outside of Pompeii, it is not unusual to find depictions of garden prospects in domestic settings during this late Republican or early empire period. Here we have an example panel from the famous garden room at Prima Porta. And this is part of a floor to ceiling, all surrounding fresco inside the villa of Livia, the wife of the actual emperor, Augustus. And how can this topic or material tell us about real people in the past? First, as a physical space, the remains of gardens can help inform us on the horticultural activities of the Romans of the past. These kind of natural history investigations allow us to think about what was planted by the Romans and also where, 
And this also gives us clues as to why these particular plants may have been planted in these locations. And complementary literary sources are also very useful to think about who was working or managing these garden spaces. Pliny the Elder, for example, suggests that the garden was traditionally the responsibility of the woman of the house. Whereas Columella, writing more about a larger agricultural estate, he discusses garden spaces as part of the roles of the villicus or the overseer or manager basically of that estate. But we always have to remember that the garden is not just a physical space. It really transcends its physicality as a setting in which societies like the Romans embed powerful myths, beliefs, and also fictions. If we go back to Livia's garden room, we should remember that this is not just simply a beautiful garden fresco, but it can also be understood as part of a very deliberate monopolization of specific plant types to establish a sort of botanic mythology around the Emperor Augustus and his family. Laurel and oak, for example, feature prominently in this garden fresco. And here we have a prominent oak tree panel from the garden room. And both laurel and oak were significant for the Emperor Augustus. They played a central role on the day that he was actually given the name Augustus, changing from Octavian. And also the villa of Livia itself was also said to be the location of a very sacred laurel grove from which the Emperor Augustus picked leaves for his triumphal crowns. So the power of the Roman garden then lies in its simultaneous existence as an idea, as a place, and also as an action. Thank you for watching and don't forget to also check out the Peopling the Past website for more ancient world content.